It's uh, about a half an hour of prophecy focus global updates, some current events and Bible prophecy issues. And uh, then we'll get into Acts chapter 19 uh, after that, and we'll be looking at it. It's really uh, quite an interesting subject we'll look at tonight regarding demon possession, oppression, and some of those things, as well as uh, uh, the working of miracles, signs, wonders, and miracles that were taking place when the Apostle Paul was on his third missionary journey. So some very interesting things tonight. But before we do, let's pray, and uh, thanks for being here tonight. We'll get started. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for these folks that are here tonight. Thank you for the venue of the internet and uh, the many venues that uh, we have through that where folks can watch and uh, enjoy and learn and we pray that you bless our time together tonight pray for the youth groups that uh, you bless them for summer quest and for our teen group uh, bless the leadership there as they sacrifice their time and give to help young people grow in their walk with christ and then of course, for anyone here in the building tonight that's never placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus for eternal life, might they find him before they leave here tonight. So, Father, we commit all this to you. Uh, we ask that you'd uh, meet with us in a special way and revive us, Lord, as uh, we need a little more strength to get through the rest of the week. And we'll give the praise for it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so uh, what we've been doing, and uh, Josh Steele, of course, was here the last two Wednesday nights. Um, just not that you really care what I've been doing, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, two weeks ago, Valerie had a, a family reunion in Great Falls, Montana. So that's, she's from the Montana area, little teeny town of less than 100 folks. And uh, her family came in from all over the country. So uh, four days to, uh, in Montana. So we, we left here, we did Sunday morning. Here, flew out, got to Bozeman, Montana, uh, Yahoo, and uh, stayed there for about five minutes and got in a car, drove four miles or four hours up to Great Falls and just, ab yeah, double the population. It was, it was wonderful. And, uh, I mean, just absolutely gorgeous country and had a great time with her family. Came back, I was home Friday night, then we were here Saturday and Sunday morning again. Uh, preached Sunday morning last or two weeks ago. Hopped on, uh, hopped in our car, went down to Covington, Kentucky uh, for the Independent Fundamental Churches of America Conference, which was Monday through, actually Monday night through Friday morning. Uh, got back in the car, drove what should have been a seven hour trip in nine hours with Chicago traffic and uh, got back Friday night. Of course, we had a great uh, Saturday at the Dabinskys with uh, the 4th of July fire, or fire. Well, yeah, they did have fireworks, man. They were fantastic. Uh, they were better. I was at Hales Corners fireworks last night. What uh, they put on at uh, uh, what uh, Alex and others that were part of that, it was twice as good as the city put on. And I'm not kidding. It was just phenomenally good. If you missed it, if they, they still, we still got any shuckles left, you don't want to miss it next year. Uh, it was really great. So anyway, that's where, what we've been up to, and uh, we're back in the saddle now. No more traveling until the end of September, and uh, we're looking forward to God doing some great things here during this time. Good to see those of you back from vacation, and for those that will be going on vacation, cancel your vacation, stay here, why not? No, I always encourage folks. You need to get away on occasion, get some R&R, &R, and you come back refreshed and ready to go, and uh, that's a good thing. All right, so we've been basically harnessing ourselves on things in Revelation 13. We're going to pull a little bit away from that today, but all of the things that we're looking at, we're looking at current events that are setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. All of these issues, we, we look at this, we see these things, we get concerned about them, but again, all these negative things that we see happening domestically and inter internationally are truly setting the stage for what God is going to do when we get to the book of Revelation, specifically chapter 13. So uh, we're going to start with this one. Again, uh, this, this is actually, I was really happy to find this particular article. We've been talking about transhumanism and uh, bef uh, the before the two weeks that Josh filled in for me, 
But uh, we were talking about transhumanism, and it's like we're not talking about transgenderism, we're talking about transhumanism. And then this article pops out from the Washington Stand on transgenderism and transhumanism, and I'm like, all right, we're, we're going we're gonna to pull both of these concepts together tonight. So uh, I'm going to read, a, has anybody seen this article or read it? Anybody? Oh, perfect, good. So I can do this and you never know the difference. All good. All right, so uh, before I get into the article, though, it's like, well, why are we looking at this stuff? It's like, are, are you just trying to pick out a social issue and make a big deal out of it? Uh, quite the contrary. God has basically given me and you as Bible-believing Christians. He set the stage for exactly what we should be doing today, his principles. And when we see these things popping up and getting as much traction as they are, it, once again, it's truly setting the stage for that which is to come. Uh, uh, things are going to get worse and worse, the Bible tells us, uh, as we get closer to when Christ takes us out of here. Uh, just a reminder, before we get into transgenderism and transhumanism, Matthew chapter 19, And he, or Jesus, answered and said to them, Have you not read that he, or God, who made them at the beginning, made them male and female? That's, that's it. There's, not a, there's no other genders. There's no other types. That's it. Uh, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Right? I mean, uh, the Bible makes it very perfectly clear. It's one man, one woman, one family, and we're good to go. And, of course, when we're getting into these issues, it's the antithesis of what God designed. Romans chapter 1, just as a quick reminder, and folks, if, you, if you're not familiar with Romans 1, and we've gone through it cursory on multiple occasions, Roman 1 is absolutely key to understanding this issue with, uh, and again, there's not children here, I'm going to use the, the, the literal words, when we're talking about lesbianism, homosexuality, sodomy, all these things that are taking place, as well as the transgender issues, they're all outlined exactly where they would fall into place in the book of Romans and why they're happening. Now again, when we look at the same sex attractions and dating and marriages, this stuff has been going on for a long, long time, way back to biblical times. What we're seeing now, though, is the progression where it's not simply if you will, same-sex attraction. Now we're into this, bait, I mean, literally changing your body. I'm not a male, I'm a female, I'm not a female, I, I'm a male. This stuff, this is a part of the progression of sin in Romans. So I'm going to go through it uh, again today very quickly just to remind us. When you go to Romans 1.18, he's talking about this is the wrath of God coming down. Now you're like, wait a minute, are you saying that same-sex same sex attraction, transgenderism, all these things are part of the wrath of God. It's exactly what I'm saying because that's what uh, this passage is pointing out. God is allowing men and women who are degenerate in their mind and they just keep getting worse and worse and worse and it's actually part of God's wrath being poured out on our society to allow these things. You say, can you prove that? Yep. All right, Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now, folks, there, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The things that we just mentioned, and again, I'm not trying to offend these individuals, these groups of people. Again, if, if anyone walks into this room that, that is a practicing lesbian, homosexual, is looking to have transgender surgery or puberty blockers, whatever, you're welcome here. And, and I mean that sincerely. Now, I am not going to endorse your behavior, but I'm going to love you and try and help you and show you at least from a different perspective on things. So uh, uh, just to make that clear, this isn't a hate mail speech. This is we love you. We're trying to warn folks, here's God's principles, his way of doing things. All right, so he says, this is the wrath of God revealed against those basically that have suppressed the, the biblical truth, not biblically literate, if you remember Sunday's message, 
because that, that what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, uh, that means day one, folks, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. It's called general revelation. In other words, when you look outside today and uh, uh, the, the, you see nature, you see the thunderstorms, you see the clouds, you, you look at the people in this room today, where did all that come from? That's general revelation. When you look in the mirror and you see yourself, God says, where did you come from? Okay, again, that's basic general revelation. You see these things, you know there's a God, they, and it's innate. There's not a person ever born on this earth that doesn't have a innate understanding that God exists. Now, the older they get, the more corrupt they get, the more they try and turn away from God and come up with their... Folks, you cannot deny it. God made it very clear every single born understands there is a God. You can't get away from it. Again, the older they get, they'll deny what they really know, but it, you can't deny it. All right? Uh, being understood by the things that are made, even in his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God's saying, listen, you, you, you see these things. You can deny me. You can say I, I don't exist, but uh, I'm not buying it. Now, folks, if God's the judge of all the world and he's not buying it, those folks have a problem. Agreed? I mean, it's a serious problem. All right, moving on, verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, neither were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. All right, so uh, a man, woman, uh, 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 they, they reject God on his face, and God says their heart is darkened. Obviously symbolic, uh, uh, metaphorical type language, but the heart, instead of being what it should be, basically we're talking about the mind, the conscience, the moral uh, uh, astuteness, if you will, becomes darkness. Professing to be wise. Hey, I know more than God, God does. What does God say? They become fools. It's absolute foolishness. And change the glory. Okay, here's step one. They change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. In other words, I don't want to wreck the beautiful stuff that's up here, but uh, they say, all right, this is my God right here. This beautiful candlestick and the candle, that's my candle God. I mean, it, it, and, and that's what people have done, the idolatry that exists. So they make things just like they did in Old Testament times, and uh, we, don't, we don't really practice, quote-unquote, idolatry today. We just worship things that really we shouldn't be worshiping. Uh, we don't say, well, this is my God. Well, some of us will say, well, my house is my God, or my car is my God, or my job is my God, or my school is my God, or my diploma is my God, or my, my bank book's my God. So uh, we don't worship things, if you will, but yet we still have that same mentality. And God says when that happens, when you worship things instead of God, you've got a problem, and here's what happens. Therefore, because of idolatry, because of turning away from God, number one, God gave them up to uncleanness. It's part of the wrath of God from verse 18. And the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Well, what does he mean by that? Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature, the idolater, if you will, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Uh, uncleanness. In other words, our minds are corrupted. We're starting to think thoughts we shouldn't think. We're going down to places we shouldn't go. And that degenerate attitude is full force at this point. For this reason, God gave them up, part of God's wrath, to what? Vile passions. All right, now here we go. Here's, here's, here's the next piece. The woman exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. All right, and again, uh, some of you are cringing in your seats right now, uh, uh, but, but it's, this is part of God's wrath. The issue of homosexuality and lesbianism is absolutely the wrath of God coming down on individuals. It's vile passions. That's what he calls this. Now you say, well, you're going to offend uh, 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 people by this. My intent is not to offend anyone. I really, and I mean that sincerely. My, my point isn't here to chastise people or to hurt their feelings, but it's to point out that if you're, you're embracing that lifestyle or you know people that are embracing that lifestyle, 
It's basically God having turned away from them and allowed them to pursue these things. It's not natural uh, for these things to take place. So he, he gets on women. Then he goes to the men, likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burden their lust for one another, men with men committing, committing what is shameful and receiving themselves the penalty of their error which was due. All right, so this is, this is like the first major phase of um, man with men, women with women, falling away from God's design of one male, one female, one family. It's God's judgment. Why is the government embracing God's judgment? Why are our public schools embracing God's judgment? Why are the public libraries embracing God's judgment? Because obviously they don't see it as what? God's judgment. They, they think this is the right thing, and uh, uh, for the, of course, there they come up with their millions and billions of years that society has existed when God says it's only 6,000 years old, but uh, they're, they're corrupting it. And why is it so much more now than it's ever been before? Why is every agenda pushing us? Those of you that have a, a little bit lighter colored hair based on age. I mean, when you were a kid, seriously? I, I mean, no, no way. This is not happening. Now, I mean, it, it's, I, we were at uh, an event yesterday. And I, I think I've told you this one before. So I'm at the Ark, I don't know, a year or two ago, you know, big giant Noah's Ark, and uh, I was not there this time in Kentucky, but I went, I went to it. How many of you have been to the Ark? All right, so I walk out of the Ark, and I start to walk towards the parking lot, and I, and I about had a fit. I'm like, what in the world was Ken Ham thinking? He put a big old rainbow over the entrance to the park, He put a big old rainbow over the entrance to the park of where the ark is, and the rainbow, oh yeah. You see how the mind all of a sudden got swayed? Instead of saying, oh yeah, there's, there's a, a, God bless Ken Ham, he put the ark up as a reminder to, or the uh, uh, rainbow up as a reminder that God will no longer judge the world by a flood. My mind was so indoctrinated into what is taking place in our country that I immediately went to the wrong place. It's like, no, he was not supporting the LGBTQI plus community. He was supporting biblical creationism, and he was supporting that God said he was going to protect us from a worldwide flood. Now, folks, I mean, I was actually astounded. I'm like, I can't believe that happened. How? But you see how the world indoctrinates us. Folks, I was around when this stuff was like, no way, no how. Now it's like it's every day, every place, everywhere. It's just constant. All right, so let's move on. And I do have another lesson I'm supposed to teach. I'll get there. Romans 1.28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, next, next phase, God gave them to a what mind? Debased mind. Now, wait a second. God just said part of his wrath was, was basically the lesbian and the homosexual uh, uh, actions, which, again, have been going on since biblical times. And now God says, when, if, if, they don't stra if people don't straighten up, if they don't get right with me, if they don't want to retain God in their knowledge, here's, here's the final step. I'm going to give them over to a debased mind. Now, folks, again, you did not hear about puberty suppression drugs when I was a kid. You did not hear about gender reassignment surgery, except maybe in a very bizarre context. It, it just didn't happen. You didn't have the government and public schools and the library and government and, and, the, and the populace and the media pushing what is happening today. Why? Well, because God says you're going to keep going down a rotten hill I'm going to keep casting my wrath upon you and allowing these things to take place. Now, I put those three words up there, and, and folks, it should. It should shock the conscience as to what's taking place today. It's horrible, but it's part of God's wrath. And, and that's very interesting that God said, listen, you're going you're to basically and use the word. If you're going to play the fool, I'm going to let you go down these horrible roads to where we're headed right now. 
not us, but the, the country as a whole. I, it's still unbelievable. All right. Uh, let me just give you a couple things. Again, uh, for those that just came in, this is on a particular article on transgenderism and transhumanism, an interview with Dr. Uh, Gerard Casey, uh, who's he's not, I won't call him a conservative Christian, but he's got some conservative things to say. He said, but generally speaking, what it, what it means, in other words, uh, the transgender, transhumanist issues, is if you take the two elements of the term trans and humanism, trans meaning across or beyond, it means beyond humanism. Pretty simple. And there's a possibility, according to the transhumanists, that we can go beyond what we are now to become something very different. In fact, almost a new species so that we can leave aside the limitations of our bodies which would allow us to go travel to other planets. We can enhance our cognitive and sensory capabilities so that we can know more and know better and see and experience and hear better. We can, we can according to them, if we undergo certain changes, especially, for example, either meshing with machines, robots, or cyborgs, or even better, leaving aside all reasonably concrete forms of embodiment. And in so doing, live as it were forever, and so leave the limitations of humanity as it is now. That's about as much as I can say. All right, so, and I mean, again, back when I was a kid, you, it's like, oh, this is cool. This is like a good science fiction movie. And now we've got PhDs talking about the reality of what's happening. And it's like craziness, right? I, I mean, it's just absolutely like crazy, weird, off the charts. Wow. Uh, uh, but it's happening. Why? Because God is allowing these things to take place. Let's, uh, I'm, I'm going to quit on that article with that. But uh, just as a reminder, when it comes to these transhumanism, transgenderism, uh, uh, all these different things that are happening, but know this, that in the last days, perilous, dangerous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Now, I'm going to make one little caveat here. Not on the transgenderism. There's no excuse for it. Shouldn't happen. Never should happen. It's anti-Bible. Now, when we're or on transgenderism, when we're talking about transhumanism, the end goal of what they're trying to accomplish is going to be a major biblical issue. But here... I, I do want to say this, and I talked about it a little bit a couple of weeks ago. There are some what we'll call positive outcomes that are associated with this. You say, well, how's that? Such a thing as an individual, and I, I gave the story three weeks ago, I think, girl born without an arm and put on a prosthetic device that actually, and she had one all her life, and, you know, you do things, and somehow, I don't know how the nerves things work, but she could use it to some degree. They put on this new upgraded bionic top arm, which is part of what the transhumanist agenda is. They hook it up to her. She goes down and... I can feel that. All right, so, I mean, it, it, when you look at that, there there's certain things, and I, and I don't know how all that works. Uh, I'm not a, a doctor or a, a son of a doctor or even married to a doctor. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> The issue being, you know, it's like, okay, so some of these things actually have some positive benefits, uh, uh, but, and again, we'll get into the buts a lot, uh, on a different time. Now, Josh uh, Steele went through uh, 20 different things regarding transhumanism and some of the issues with that. The, the whole goal of the transhumanist is to transcend our bodies and to be able to live eternally. Now, folks, here's a simple question. Are you going to live eternally? Yes. Absolutely are. Are you going to have to become a transhumanist in order to live for eternity? Absolutely not. Uh, the, the issue is these people that are unsaved, they're unbiblical, they're trying to figure out how to, where's the, back when I was a kid, what was the deal? Uh, find the, the, um, the fountain of youth. Yeah, you, you drink the right water, you live forever. Well, it hadn't happened yet, folks. 
Uh, but uh, the only way to live eternally and have a good outcome is to trust Christ as your personal Savior, and you will live for eternal eternity in a very nice place called heaven. Uh, those that reject Christ, uh, including those that uh, decide to be, follow this transhumanist agenda, you're going to die. Transhumanist folks, you're going to die. I hate to tell you that, but it's true. And uh, you will not live forever in this body, but you will live forever. I will give you some good news, transhumanists. You will live forever. The unfortunate thing is, if you refuse to trust Christ, it's a forever. Uh, the Bible tells us, Revelation 21, 8, in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which never goes out. So, in the last days, perilous times will come. One more, 2 Timothy 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. All right, I'm going to go to one other issue, which is taking place. I just actually uh, got cleaned up, uh, actually at the end of today in Israel. Palestinians defiant and angry against Israel's Jenin raid. Um, why is this important? Folks, the Palestinians or the Arab community uh, are those that are, uh, you look at the lines of Jacob and Esau, and then you look at the line of Ishmael and all these different issues. Why has Israel constantly been under attack from their Arab Palestinian uh, uh, neighbors? Uh, it's, it's because it started way back in the book of Genesis, and it's not going to end until Christ comes back to set up his millennial kingdom in Revelation 20. So again, this just took place. Uh, I don't know how well you can see the picture. The one in the bottom left there is just a home that's been destroyed, and the uh, IDF helicopters, Israel Defense Force coming in. If you look on the map on the right, uh, Jenin, which is um, at least the way that I've been hearing on the media, Jenin is uh, in that kind of darkish, a little darker area. That's all what's known as the West Bank of Israel. You can see Jerusalem is really, it is the border. That's the last piece, if you will, since 1967 of the territory that belongs to the Jewish people at this point. All right, so everything in that West Bank area uh, belongs to the Palestinians based on the wars and so forth. Uh, one caveat, by the way, folks, all that land does belong to the Israelis. They just don't have it yet. Okay, It's, it's Jewish property according to Genesis 15, but uh, based on the wars, the, the Jewish people have about a tenth of the property uh, that uh, God says they will have when we hit the Millennial Kingdom. All right, so Jenin is a refugee camp for Palestinians. I'm going to just give you a couple of things. And you're like, well, why do we care about this? Again, it's part of the prophetic scenario. There's going to be these conflicts. There's going to be these constant wars between the Palestinians and the Jewish people until Christ comes back and sets everything straight. Uh, so let's see, just a couple of things here. So the Jenin refugee camp, it has about, and, and the the numbers differ. They're as small as about 11,000 inhabitants up to 15,000. It was formed in the 1950s basically to protect Palestinians that were being run out of other countries. It's, it's, uh, it's not a pleasant place. It's not a, I mean, it, it's kind of, I don't even know. It, it's substandard living. Uh, it, it's just not pleasant. But these camps were put together for Palestinian refugees basically that needed a place to stay. Uh, it actually has been the source uh, of part of the, there's two what are called intifadas, basically uh, where the Palestinians have raged out against the Jewish people. Uh, one back in about the 1990s, another one in the, uh, the mid, well, basically about 2002 and forward for a couple of years. And a lot of the problems against the Jewish people came out of this particular camp. Uh, they were fighters, they're, they're warriors, and they were used, if you will, in part of the groups that attacked the Israelis. So the last two days, and folks, this just happened, the last two days, uh, the Israel Defense Force said, listen, not too many terrorist groups are coming out of this camp. They're hiding weapons, they're, they're hiding artillery, 
and we need to go in there and clean it out. This is not the first time the Israel Defense Force has gone into that camp in the last 30 years or so uh, to clean weapons out. So they go in there, they do have a, a significant uh, a conflict. Uh, they, let's see, the Jenin camp, uh, let me get the right ones here. Uh, last one, actually, when they went into the camp uh, in April of 2002, 400 homes were destroyed, hundreds more were severely damaged, and that was way back uh, 20 years ago. And uh, what is happening now? Well, uh, again, they're a stockpile for terrorists to form. So you got the different terrorist groups that are there. Uh, do you remember, many of you will remember this one, uh, May of 2022, Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akhle was killed in the Jenin camp while trying to cover an Israeli raid. Do you remember? I mean, this was huge in the news about a year ago. Uh, they were trying to blame, blame the Israel Defense Force for killing this Al Jazeera journalist. Biden got involved with this. It was, it was a big to-do. Uh, but this is the, the same place that uh, the Jewish folks uh, Israel, Israel Defense Force raided just a, uh, actually two days ago. Well, why did they do that? Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is, and I'm going to read it to you from an article from, let's see if I did, no, I didn't put it up. Uh, it's by Palestinians Defiant, Defiant and Angry by Ali Sawafda out of uh, Reuters. Uh, Palestinian militant fighters paraded in Jenin on Wednesday and angry crowds confronted senior Palestinian Authority officials accusing them of weakness. Now, catch this, folks. Again, the West Bank area, that's Palestinian Authority land. It is not Jewish property. The Palestinians basically got whooped big time. They got a bunch of their homes destroyed. They had about a dozen folks that got killed and uh, one Jewish uh, uh, soldier was killed. But they are absolutely furious with the Palestinian Authority because they didn't come out heavily, more heavily armed and try and take out the Israel Defense Force. Big riots taking place right now as we speak. I was just watching them before I came in here. The two-day operation, which the Israeli army said targeted infrastructure and weapons depot of militant factions in the Janine refugee camp, let the trail of wrecked streets and burned-out cars and spark fury across the Arab world. At least 12 Palestinians, most confirmed as militant fighters, were killed and around 100 wounded in an incursion that began with late-night drone strikes followed by a sweep involving more than 1,000 Israeli troops. All right, electricity's gone, water's gone, all sorts of problems. A uh, couple more paragraphs. Israel forces detained 150 suspected militants seed large caches of money, guns, and roadside mines, including an arsenal, arsenal under a mosque, a great place to hide your guns, and destroyed a command center, the army said. It said all the Palestinians killed were armed fighters. Islamic Jihad claimed eight as members, with Hamas claiming another. I watched, uh, uh, and I, of course, one of these days we'll figure out how to put video up here when I'm uh, up here, which we haven't done yet. That's coming. Uh, but anyway, I, I watched, and they're, they're saying, listen, this uh, IDF uh, car is coming by, tank. It wasn't a tank, it was an armored vehicle. Boom. I mean, just blew it to pieces, and, of course, that caused a casualty. So why, why bring this up? Why do we care about these things? Well, because, again, this all has to deal with Bible prophecy. The Palestinians, those who hate the Jewish people, are constantly going to be attacking them until Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom. You see the little teeny section called Israel on the map. Well, everything within that red border belongs to the Jewish people. They just don't have it yet. Uh, but uh, again, when Jesus Christ comes back, when he sets up his uh, kingdom in Jerusalem, all of that land that you see inside that red border will once again belong to the Jewish people. One other thing, and I always like to go here, Daniel 9, verse 27, reminds us of what's going to take place in the future. Then here the Antichrist shall confirm a covenant or a peace treaty with Israel for one week or seven years, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Why do we bring this up? Why does the Antichrist need to come and make a peace treaty with the Jewish people? Because they're under constant attack. 
and they're going to continue to be under constant attack, all of a sudden the Antichrist is going to show up. And this is part of God's prophetic calendar. All of a sudden the Jewish people are what? They're going to have peace for three and a half years, and then the worst Holocaust of all time will take place after that. So, uh, again, why, is the, why are these things? They're setting the stage. Listen, Israel has to stand or attack. Why? Because the Antichrist has to have a reason to come in and save Israel, and that will happen in God's prophetic future. All right, let's move on to Acts chapter 19, if you got your Bible. So that's the end of our Prophecy Focus Global Update for tonight. And the rest of the time, we're going to spend the next chapter 19, verse 11 to 20. We're going to talk about apostolic signs, wonders, and miracles, specifically as uh, the Apostle Paul was referencing them. And uh, we'll look at several other passages in Acts about what are signs, what are wonders, what are miracles. Why do we call them apostolic signs, wonders, and miracles? Why do we, uh, uh, as a Christian community, and why do many churches around the country and around the world, they're looking for things that are signs, wonders, and miracles, and some people will come up with, well, this is a, a sign, this is a wonder, this is a miracle. Well, we need to understand what biblical signs, wonders, and miracles are, and it's causing a great deal of confusion within the Christian community, even as we speak today. All right. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Now this is a very interesting scenario. Now remember, was Paul an apostle, by the way? Absolutely he was. It's during apostolic times. It's during the first century. And God was allowing the apostle Paul to do some things that, quite frankly, were considered what? Very unusual. How unusual? And he says, well, here's how unusual it gets. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, that again, it's like when we were talking about some of the things that were bizarre that uh, are happening in our culture today, you look at these things back in biblical times, it's like, wow, that is really unusual. Well, it was unusual, and God even admits it was unusual and uses that word. So now God worked this unusual miracle. So now, was the power in the handkerchief, was the, I mean, it, it, where, where's the power coming from? I mean, God himself. So, but God used the Apostle Paul, he used this symbolic things to do some miraculous things. So let's, right here we start, and, and as we go through these different things, these signs, wonders, and miracles, God will define what constitutes a sign, what constitutes a miracle, what constitutes uh, these type of wonders. So what, it, what happened? They take this, if you will, this handkerchief that was, uh, uh, or apron that was part, came from, from uh, uh, the Apostle Paul, from his body, and they took it to what? The sick. And the diseases left them. All right? So, now, now if you, and uh, I'm going to date myself a little bit. If you used to watch, uh, and I hate to bring up his name because I don't like the name names, but he's one of the ones that did it, uh, Baker. And you, uh, the, the television, he's like, listen, would you touch the television or would you mail, I'll mail you a private hanky or whatever. And they did, they had all these ways, basically it was fundraising is what it amounted to. But it's like, if you do this, uh, we'll send you this. If you put your hand onto the TV, if you uh, 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 send me your handkerchiefs, we'll pray over them. And they were basically uh, taking this passage and horribly abusing it. But uh, it's like, you'll be healed. You know, send me 100 bucks uh, along with that, that handkerchief and we'll pray for healing for you. Uh, uh, so people have tried to mimic this, and, and unfortunately so. But back in apostolic times when Paul was there, this was actually a reality. The sick were actually healed. What else? Diseases left them. So the sick were being healed. Those who had specific diseases were being healed. And here's a third thing that God classified as a miracle evil spirits went out from them. Now, I've talked about this many a time. 
And uh, we actually, uh, it, it was some folks I was talking to yesterday, we had a, a nice little conversation about demonic possession. What is demonic possession today? Where do you see it? And I've been around Christianity for a long time, 50 plus years. I've been involved with mental health people through the jail system. Uh, I've had people that have come and said, my so-and-so relative is, I think they're demon-possessed. And we have these ideas about what it truly is. And yet, it's extremely almost impossible to define and show. Now, we have people that are in different countries where spiritism and mysticism and these things, things seem to be much more prevalent there. The only thing I can tell you about in, in America is when, and again, I go back to the jail situation, when somebody is so out of control on the street that the police have to be called in, they're violent, they're superhuman strength, they're beyond normal, they get arrested, they bring them down to what they call the special needs unit in a jail which are highly secure. I've watched individuals that uh, uh, have gone up, TVs are, have big, giant, you know, one and a half inch, two inch bolts that are holding TVs on the wall. I've watched as, I mean, I've literally seen a guy grabs a TV, pulls it right off the wall. I've watched and I've been involved when uh, some people are, they're out of control. You're trying to go into their area, get them under control. You know, we've got five, 10 guys, including guys my size, and they're tossing us around like rag dolls. So why is that? Well, again, is it demon possession? Is it some hyper form of mental illness where these things are taking place? And, and folks, I got to be honest, after being involved in this in 50 plus years, I don't know. It's that difficult to discern. Uh, I've had people come say, listen, my child's demon-possessed, they're acting weird, they're out of control, they're, and it's usually a behavioral issue. Now, I've been in other situations where I've seen things that are bizarre and weird, uh, but it's so hard to define. And in our culture, for whatever reason, is Satan alive and well? Is the demonic world alive and well? I mean, absolutely. And I think the demonic world does more damage by uh, putting thoughts in Christians' heads and others, then it's like all they got to do is disrupt people. Don't really need to go to all this bizarre stuff because it's too obvious and they're just going to throw them in jail anyway. So it's very difficult to discern. And uh, uh, I've dealt with, and, and when I was at Moody Bible Institute, uh, Professor Fred Dickinson, who wrote a book on angels, demons, and or holy elect, or holy angels, elect and evil, and uh, I. I mean, I went through his course. He was basically known as the greatest guy in demonology at the time. Uh, he played tapes of people that were in his office uh, when he's literally seemingly casting demons out. And it's just like if you, and I'm not recommending you watch the movie The Exorcist, but I mean, it was almost, I, it wasn't a silly head spinning and all that, but the yelling and the different voices and all that type of thing. But it's very bizarre. It's very weird. And our culture, quite frankly, uh, it's very difficult to discern uh, between if someone is demon-possessed or if it's simply some behavioral disorder or a mental illness. And uh, I've, I've talked to psychiatrists, uh, Christian and non-Christian. I've talked to doctors, Christian and non-Christian. And it's just, boy, and uh, theologian after theologian, and it, it's just very, very difficult in our culture to figure this one out. So the bottom line is, and the why I'm giving you all that preface is, is because when we get into this issue of uh, casting out demons in a little bit, there's people that tried to do that back in Bible times, and the results were not real good. And I caution people when we get into these things to be very, very, very careful when you're going into this type of a scenario. And stick with me, and I'll, I'll explain why as we go through this. All right, so the bottom line, though, is miraculous things were taking place uh, uh, Paul, just simply things he wore, uh, uh, God used them during the first century apostolic times, not on the TV with the, the Jim Baker, 
to do these miraculous things. And they were literal and they were godly. Second Corinthians chapter 12. I have become a fool in boasting, Paul says. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Now here's the confirmation. Truly the signs of a what? A apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in, and here's the three things again, signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. All right, so God was absolutely unequivocally using these wonderful things, these wondrous things, these miraculous signs uh, during the apostolic times. Why? Because they were confirming this new message, which was brand new, hot off the press, Jewish people, Old Testament law, Old Testament books, all of a sudden Jesus shows up and everything changes. How are you going to authenticate that message? Well, God says, I got a good methodology. How about through signs, wonders, and miracles? And that's exactly what he used. So every time uh, uh, Paul would do something or the apostles would do something, and every time a, a miraculous thing took place, did that help authenticate their message? I mean, absolutely. Did it help authenticate who Jesus was when he did signs, wonders, and miracles? Absolutely. It's like people flock to him. Uh, uh, I, I tell you. We could, have, we could have the world's largest crowd form if someone could actually show up in a stadium and actually truly heal people. I, I mean, it would be, I, I'd be there, you'd be there, we'd all be there. I mean, I got some maladies I'd love to have fixed. I mean, and everybody go. And if that person could actually do it and, and it was authenticated, we'd all say, praise the Lord, that's a man of God. Or, you know, it, it, I wish it would happen again, but... We're not in that time period, but it did happen. It was absolutely true. Acts chapter 2, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers, the fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Again, we're, and what we're doing, and by the way, I didn't preface this, we're going from Acts chapter 2 all the way, we're going to bring out every set of miracles that's being done in the book of Acts tonight. It won't take that long. It sounds, well, that's going to take a long time. It actually, we'll get through it pretty quickly. But what's the point? God was using signs, wonders, miracles to authenticate his message. All right, next one, Acts chapter 4. Now, Lord, look on their hearts and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to do what? To heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, I'm looking at someone on purpose right now because uh, this passage had come up. And it's like, okay, and, and there's arguments on both sides of this particular concept. Who, are, who, are sitting, who is sitting in this room? Who, who's, who's in this room waiting? It's about 120 disciples, right? And, and they're all hanging out. They're waiting for something miraculous to happen. And uh, in Acts chapter 2, actually, this starts. And now we got another group assembled there. And, and the contention is, and actually, let's go to it. Let's spend a minute because this, this issue came up. Let's take your Bible go to Acts 4. While you're, while, you're, while you're taking your Bible and going to Acts chapter 4, last Sunday, and if you weren't here, you don't know about this, uh, we are challenged to get back to biblical literacy. Biblical literacy. In other words, um, and, and I almost hesitate. It's like I always put the scripture up on the screen. But you know what? If I put the scripture up on the screen, what's the, what's the incentive to bring your Bible to church? And I kind of thought about that. And it's like a lot of you still bring it, even though I put it up on the screen. But it's like... Um, you know, wouldn't it be better if we had our own Bible and opened it up and turned to the passage? So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of do half and half to force us to use our Bibles in uh, the services. All right, Acts chapter 4, 
Uh, let's go to. That's the start of verse 13. So when, Acts 4, 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside out of the council, the Sanhedrin council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evidence to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we can deny it tonight. So Peter heals a guy, causes a great uproar with the Jewish people. Verse 18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in your sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Now, folks, uh, if you were here Sunday, we were talking about uh, follow the ordinances of, of the government. But there are caveats to that. This is one of them. When, when the government says, close your church down and don't preach Jesus anymore, we say, sorry, cannot comply. Now, I'm, I'm going to obey the, obey the government every which way I possibly can, but when you say the church is shut down, when you say we can't preach Jesus anymore, we're just going to have to take our chances on that, and just like Peter and John did. By the way, it did cost them their life eventually. Huh? Uh, so when they had further threatened them, verse 21, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. Verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are a God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why do the na nations rage? The people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Verse 27, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, so now this is an interesting conundrum, because who's in the room? Hmm? Yeah, the Holy Spirit's there. Who's the people? Okay. Anyone else? All right, how do we know, though, that it, does it spell it out in the context here? Because we know that they had an issue. They, they get away from that particular issue. Now they come back to talk to whom and who gets, and then what, who's in that room? Who's actually, uh, uh, say what? Okay, maybe, but I don't think so. Okay, and being let go, verse 23, they went to their own companions, reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Doesn't say they're in the room. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth. And they go through it, uh, basically uh, going through the Old Testament passage. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do to whatever. He's basically going through a scenario. Uh, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they, now that's the key thing here. Who is the they? Everybody in the room. Who is in the room? Believers. Believers. Do we know specifically who? It's really kind of nebulous. It's open. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it really does. It uses pronouns here, and it doesn't quite define exactly who's there. Now, we know who's speaking. We know contextually, and it's like, well, the chief priests and elders had said to them, 
Well, these were the Jewish ones that weren't exactly on their side. So we have uh, uh, these individuals there, whoever it is, God does what? Well, he, he tells us a verse again, uh, by stretching out your hand to heal and the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. All right, so uh, I mean, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, you go to the upper room, you got the 120 disciples, the Holy Spirit comes down on them and they're all basically, the uh, uh, Bible tells us they're all speaking in, in other languages. So it's very interesting here. So we got the two scenarios, one in Acts 2 where we got 120. We have this one here. The, the question is, and here's really where the question came from. The question was, could anyone besides the apostles, besides the apostles, have a sign gift? And where do you get that from? 1 Corinthians 13, I mean, it's explicitly clear there. So uh, uh, during the first century, during apostolic times, and yes, I'm, I'm confining it to that for tonight, were people besides the apostles able to do at least certain sign gifts back in New Testament times? Oh, well, absolutely. There's there no doubt about it. Um, and I firmly believe that when the tribulation happens, according to Joel chapter 2, that those sign gifts will be reinstated. So, again, I don't want to get into controversial issues with the charismatic movement, apostolic movement, and all that. But it's interesting here that, yes, God, uh, I thoroughly believe that when he says all people here, everyone involved, whether they're an apostle or not, they were able to do certain sign gifts, but that God definitely gave specific things that the apostles could do that uh, it does not appear that others outside of the apostolic realm could do, like the handkerchief thing. You ever see that again in Scripture? You don't. It's like a, a one-time interesting thing where God said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless this particular methodology today, and he did. All right, well, let's move on. I, I, I'm trying to get us to think, you know, what happened then and why are things happening today differently? Chapter 5 now. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in. Now, this is a story of Aquila and Priscilla. They go out, they, they sell a property, and... Uh, they're, they're saying they're going to give all the money that they got for selling the property back to basically the work of God. And they lie about it. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Again, what happened? Her husband comes in and says, yeah, you know, he really sold it for, let's just say, $10,000. But uh, he tells uh, the apostles, "Nah, I got it for. I sold it for eight thousand dollars." He pockets the two thousand, doesn't tell them, and gives them the eight thousand. What what happened to him? God killed him. He killed him. And uh, his wife comes in, didn't know that her husband got was dead because he lied. What happens to her? Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She lies and said, "Yep, for so much." Peter said to her, "How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look." The feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Now here's the key part again. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. What's the sign here? What's the wonder here? People dropping over dead when they lied to the Holy Spirit. I mean, that, that's pretty authenticating. And Peter's standing right there and saying, listen, you're a liar, and you're going to die right now. Boom, she's dead. What do you think would happen if that happened in our church? You'd probably change membership real quick. But, <laughs> I mean, seriously, though, can you imagine this takes place? Is that going to get the Christian community's attention? Whoa! Well, you bet you it is. Thank God he doesn't do that anymore. Those of you that uh, wish we uh, practice signs, wonders, and miracles, be careful what you ask for here. Hmm. Chapter 6, verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Of course, Stephen was martyred for his faith, uh, but God used him in a great way as well. 
Uh, Acts chapter 8, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. Let me see, was Philip part of the discipleship team? You bet. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For un okay, now he's going to find miracles again. Here's some of the things that God classified as miracles. Unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. Many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Now, folks, this Sunday, and I'm not going to say who the person is, but most of you do, but I don't want to put it on the air right now. I walked into a room with a particular person who was paralyzed on part of the body. Now, folks, if I had to gift of healing like they had right here, I would have prayed over that person and up they go and away, and away they go. That was a gift of healing. Right there, bam, miracle. Now, that person who went through this, and uh, those of you know who I'm talking about, and again, I'm just not going to say it over the air right now, is making progress. But you know how that progress is going to come? We keep praying. We keep begging God to heal her. And we look forward to full recovery. But we pray and we beg God. It's not the same. Uh, and folks, this is, and, and when, you, when we listen to these folks that say they have the gift of healing, no, they have the gift of praying the same as the rest of us. We pray and beg God and ask God to do things. Boy, I really shouldn't go here, but I'm going to. About six months ago, I called the pastor of the church of probably the largest Assembly God church in our in. Wisconsin. And they had had a healing service the Sunday before. I listened to it. So I was interested. And uh, I called, uh, called up uh, the church and I got the pastor's son who's an associate pastor at this particular church. And I said, listen, I said, I, I listened to your service. I said, I'm, I'm really interested. You had people come forward, many people come forward to uh, be healed. And I said, you know, I and, and this is the truth. I said, you know, I got an eye I can't see out of. And I'm like, man, I'd love my eye to get healed. And what can you do for me? And he said, well, you know, we really don't have things like that happen in our service. And I said, well, what does happen in your service? And he said, well, you know, I, I can tell you some of the folks and what, what they were healed of. And I'm like, well, great, tell me. And he said, well, there's uh, uh, several people. They had uh, uh, pains in their back or pains here or pains there. And all of a sudden, you know, they came forward and no more pain. I'm like, okay, that's wonderful. Well, tell me, I mean, was anybody like with a, a serious disease healed? He says, no, nah, I don't think so. Was anybody with uh, that was blind or lame or had broken bones, any of them get healed? He says, no, nah, we, we don't see that happen. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. And, and, he's, and, and I mean, he's trying to, he's try, and I was being very kind to him. And... Uh, he made this statement. He's like, you know, we really think, we really think the closer we get to when Jesus is coming back that we're really going to see stuff like you're talking about is going to take place. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like, basically you're praying and, and God's doing some things that taking away simple pain, but there's really no, and I just put it out there, there's really no miraculous things happening like back in the New Testament times. And he immediately went back to, well, no, but we really think these things are going to start happening now because we're getting closer when Christ comes home. Now, folks, that's the largest, most influential apostolic church in Wisconsin, to my knowledge. So, what am I, why am I saying this? Be careful, right? Be on your guard. We pray for healing, and does God heal? I gave you my own testimony about a month ago two months ago probably now, went to the doctor. I knew I was on medication since I was a teenager for a particular thing. They said my kidneys would eventually shut down. I went to the doc, got the test back, said my kidneys were less than 40% active. I got a big problem. Six people went into my office because uh, my daughter told some guys. They showed up in my office. I didn't invite them. Or I mean, it's not that I didn't invite them. They invited themselves in, and I'm glad they did. And he said, hey, Pastor, we heard that uh, you got this problem with your kidneys. Can we pray for you? Uh, yeah, you can pray for me. 
I was so astounded by just the love that they showed by doing that. I couldn't, I, did, I had no idea, I couldn't remember who was in the room. I had to call, I knew one person, I called him up and said, who was in that room? Because less than a week later, I went in for my blood test again, check out my kidney status, and in one week, I went from less than 40% efficiency to 100%. Went back a couple weeks later, 100%. Now folks, he's like, well, that's just been a bad test. No, not a bad test. It was a good test. And uh, guys are praying. Now, did they touch me and say, hey, by, the, by the power invested in me, I heal you, Pastor Schmidt? No. They prayed and God answered. Now, I can't say he's going to do that for every time everybody's sick. I wish he would. But can God heal through prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Praise the Lord. He still does it. All right. Spending too long here. Next one. Uh, but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. By the way, folks, can uh, uh, Satan work witchcraft through human beings? Can they do weird, supernatural things in the demonic world? Absolutely they can, still do. Well, verse 12, But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now, was God still using apostolic things in chapter 8 to prove who they are and to authenticate their message? Yes. Verse, or chapter 14, it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles, posed, poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Again, wonderful things are taking place, authenticating the message of the gospel, chapter 15. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many what? Miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. All right, quick review. What kind of signs, wonders, and miracles have we gone to? Healing of the sick, healing of diseases, uh, um, casting out demons, uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Killing the ungodly, mm, rough miracle, but God did it. So we've got these authenticated things, signs, wonders, miracles that God was using to authenticate his message, chapter 19. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name, call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Remember when I said be careful what you do? Pay attention to this one. Verse 14. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. Who are you? And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Uh, when you're going to do spiritual warfare, you better make sure you're on the right page with, with God and so forth. And I'm not just talking about throwing or attempting to cast demons out if you ever can actually document that. But be careful about spiritual warfare. It's dangerous. And if you're not prepared, if you're not right with God and you start getting into stuff that you're not prepared for, it can be very difficult. Uh, that's why Ephesians 6 tells us to put on the full armor of God. All right, this became known both all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and, they, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Again, when God's power is in it, when, when people are doing things the right way in God's timing, uh, uh, things happen wonderfully. But back, even back during apostolic times, when somebody tried to mimic uh, things that the apostles were doing and they weren't <laughs> filled with the Holy Spirit, horrible results. Man, many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Now here's, here's an interesting thing. I had, it's not here tonight, talked with them yesterday. 
a wonderful guy, part of our church, and uh, he was talking about when he got saved. And he said, you know, when I got saved, he said he, he was a, a hard rock listener to a, a just horrible pagan type music. I'm not talking about Christian music. I'm, I'm, I'll just separate it here. He was a rock head, uh, uh, really into some seriously bad music and different things that he was involved in. And he said, you know, he says, as soon as the day I got saved, the day I got saved, I took all this trashy stuff that I had and I threw it out. Now, why he did that, I don't think he even knows why, except that he just felt led. It's like, I don't want this garbage in my house. I don't want to be tempted by it. I don't want to be part of me. Isn't it interesting here? Acts chapter 19, what happened? A bunch of folks get saved. They come to Christ. Also, verse 19, also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. That's an immense amount of money back then. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Here's, it's the interesting thing, and it, does, it doesn't always happen, but folks, when, when you come to Christ, should there be a change in your life? I mean, it really should. And uh, some people mature at a much slower pace than others. I mean, this particular person, who, by the way, uh, uh, will fully admit, even though he did that one uh, major action of throwing out all this stuff, he, he, it took him a while to start maturing in Christ. He was a little bit of a slow bloomer, so to speak. But it's like when God gets a hold of somebody and all of a sudden it's like, man, is this really glorifying God? Is what I'm doing really honoring to God? Do I really need this in my life? And boy, it's a challenge and, and it's hard. And, and again, our culture, even our Christian churches today, I mean, we enjoy nice things. We enjoy uh, uh, entertainment. We enjoy recreation. Uh, and it's fun. And we all enjoy it. And I do too. But it's like, boy, be careful. Be careful what you choose for your entertainment. Be careful what you get involved in because, man, it can have really seriously bad repercussions. And that's what he's telling us here. All right. Well, basically, that brings us to the end of this piece. But there's, there's one other thing that popped in my head, but it just popped out again. Well, I guess it's gone, and the Lord doesn't want me to touch on it. All right, so what's the point of all this? So let's summarize it very quickly. Did God use the apostles to do signs, wonders, and miracles to authenticate the message? Absolutely did. Now, here's, and again, and I want to be very sensitive to this because I'm really not trying to pick a fight with anyone in the building or out of the building. I understand there's a tremendous divergence of opinion regarding what we're going to call sign gifts today. Specifically, the massive one is speaking in tongues. That's the big controversial one today. Virtually no one is coming in saying they have the gift of healing. It, you know, how do you prove that? Well, you got to heal somebody. Okay, so that's, that's like nobody claims that. People will claim they have the gift of prophecy. In other words, that God told them specifically something that none of the rest of us know, and it's not in Scripture. That's very suspect because Revelation 22 says don't add to God's Word. Third thing that's very popular today is what's called the Word of Knowledge. Oh, God gave me this special insight. So tongues... Prophecy, knowledge, all which you cannot on any plane prove one way or the other are the three gifts, sign gifts, that basically are the most controversial today. The things that have to have documented evidence, not happening and nobody claims them. So it's very difficult. So is, is it divisive in the church today? Very divisive. Is, is it causing problems not just here in America but across the country, or, but across uh, the world? Yeah, it's all... I mean, you go into any foreign country, you go on any mission field, it's the same as it is right here in the United States of America. Baptist Church, Charismatic Church, Latter-day Saint Church, Jehovah's Witness. It's the same scenario no matter what country you go to. So what's the bottom line? Be biblically literate. Biblically literate. What is happening? Is it what God's Word says? Does it match up with Scripture? And then be very, very careful. And that's about as deep as I'm going to go because I'm going to let you come up with the right result. 
And if you're at Union Grove Baptist Church, you probably have already made your mind up on those issues. <laughs> well, folks, thanks for being here tonight. These are great things to think about. Keep watching. By the way, is God working today? Does God do miraculous things today? Yeah, God does a whole lot of miraculous things today. Does God still save souls today? Absolutely. Do we still love Jesus today like they did back in the first century? Absolutely. Those things are they're, they're mainstays. So let's, let's go to the bank on that. Thanks for being here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Lord, it's just wonderful to be able to go through the book of Acts to see the signs, wonders, and miracles that you use to confirm who you are. Lord, I get goosebumps when I, I read about the healings, when somebody was touched and all of a sudden, miraculously, they can see, they can stand up, they can run. Uh, uh, just amazing things that, that you've done. But Father, I pray now, especially for those in our, our midst, those that uh, we love and care about. F Father, we look at our bulletin and we just got uh, 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 many, many people that are suffering right now with serious illnesses. And Lord, we do believe and we pray for them, Lord, that uh, you'd heal them. We pray for those that are going through those tough, difficult times, even as we speak today. Those that have just been diagnosed with cancer. Those that are going through serious medical conditions right as we speak. Father, would you please bless the families of our folks that are going through these tough times right now. Bless the folks that are in the hospital that are dealing with these issues and trying to struggle with how do they deal with them. And Father, help us all to just go to what Peter said, to cast all our care upon you because you care for us. Father, we commit these things to you. Pray that you do your divine work and bring us back on Sunday to get together once again to study the only book you've ever, ever given to us, this precious Word of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, folks. Have a great night.